Can we talk about Jack's tweet? He sure. Did a tweet. Yeah, the hyperinflation yeah. tweet. Yeah, so he put in fl- hyperinflation is going to change everything. It's happening, uh, which I thought was a fair tweet. I mean, it's like, what, 73,000 likes right now. Uh, but I, th- I mean, I thought it was a fair tweet because uh, it wasn't geographic specific. And certainly, uh, I, th- I think it's certainly possible that we're going to see a hyperinflationary event in certain countries. But then he replied to someone, it will happen in the US soon and so the world. Uh, what is the what is the rate that is considered hyperinflation? Is it is it like forty fifty percent? So it's often considered fifty percent a month, which is which is thousands yeah, which is thousands and thousands of percent per year because uh, you you compound that for for twelve months exponentially. Uh, you you need extraordinarily high inflation. So for example, even the high inflation of Turkey and Argentina is not necessarily considered hyperinflation. Whereas, for example, you know, obviously the Weimar Republic was a hyperinflation. Zimbabwe mm-hmm. was hyperinflation. I believe Venezuela uh, it classified for, for long periods of time as hyperinflation. Uh, but above a certain point, it almost doesn't matter too much. I mean, obviously there's a difference between, mm-hmm. say, 25% inflation in Turkey versus, you know, say, a million percent inflation in, in Venezuela. There's a difference there. Uh, but once you start getting into double digits, uh, you know, inflation becomes a very obviously a major issue uh, in, in any market. Uh, and historically, hyperinflations tend to happen. You, there's kind of two big ingredients that go into making hyperinflations happen. So one is some sort of damage to your productive systems. Uh, so that can include, for example, in Zimbabwe, they reorganized how they do farming. Uh, there's you know, basically social conflict there. Uh, that's a very long story, but you know you had a production collapse. Uh, and of course, Weimar Germany after after World War One. I, I mean, they were impaired uh, in terms of the damage they sustained from the war and the economic consequences. Of that the other big catal- uh, kind of ingredient is when you have liabilities denominated in in an asset that you can't print. So in de- in developed markets, they have a lot of debt, but it's in their own currency, and so it's somewhat easier to kind of you know quote unquote taper Ponzi. You can kind of do that kind of over time. Whereas if you're an emerging market and if you say you owe dollars, right? You, there's no way that your country can create dollars other than earn them through trade. Uh, and so you can pretty easily run into default scenarios uh, and, and, and currency collapses. Same thing for Weimar Republic. They owed war reparations that were denominated in gold. Uh, and so it, it contributed to their being, being unable to service those debts. Uh, and so generally in developed markets today, we don't directly see the kind of the ingredients of hyperinflation. Uh, but, you know, so my base case for a while, the, the kind of the call that I've been making for the past, you know, a uh, couple years is that I expect the 2020s to be a pretty inflationary decade. Now, hyperinflation has not been my base case in developed markets, uh, but I don't rule it out as a possibility because, you know, after a certain point, if people lose confidence in the system, if they don't want to buy the bonds, uh, and if you start to see kind of an out of control kind of deficit monetization, uh, then anything is possible. Uh, and so especially when you combine that with energy scarcity or deglobalization or potentially any sort of black swan event that could occur, like a natural disaster or even some well-telegraphed events, like if, if, if China ever were to, say, invade Taiwan, then there's p- potential war between new, two nuclear powers. You know, who, who knows what could happen there? So there are there are catalysts that I think could get the world to a more hyperinflationary type of scenario. But it's my overall view has just been focusing on the inflation side more so than the question of hyperinflation. Yeah, I mean Jack's tweet you could you could say was slightly hyperbolic. Um I I mean other people would point and say no, it's correct this w- this will happen or it might happen, but uh I I would struggle to see the idea that the US would enter hyperinflation, but <clears throat> I think like you said you can focus on the uh actual inflation that's happening or risks of inflation and mm. and uh, as you s- r- rightly noted, like Turkey and Argentina are both experiencing very high inflation at the moment, and that has dramatic effects. That has dra- dramatic effects on the local economy and the people who live there. So even if we were to see 10, 15, 20% inflation in the US, the UK, that still would be a very bad scenario for a lot of people, especially if this was something to carry on for a decade. Yeah, and, and so one of the big things that, that I focus on is the fact that because we're 
you know, we're towards the end of this long-term debt cycle where they they pretty much have to hold rates low despite inflation, uh, uh, because otherwise, you know, the the sovereign entities are insolvent. Uh, that that opens like the, kind of the possibility of this spiraling out of control. Uh, and so, you know, if you if you want to make the hyperinflationary argument, you basically would, would go back to history and say that you know no fiat currencies lasted particularly long. Um, and so the structure that we've had in place since the 1970s, which is that the entire world is on a fiat currency standard, is very unique in human history, and it's only so far a 50-year experiment. Uh, and so especially this is the first time that the fiat currency system is tested with you know, an inflationary environment while we have this much debt in the system – uh, and real interest rates are this low. So the last time we, we did, we went through this was like the 40s in the developed world, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, and back then they had a gold peg, and so a lot of them had to break their gold peg, but then they reestablished their gold peg at a lower level, uh, and eventually, of course, transitioned to the Bretton Woods system. And so they still had a tether to commodity-based money. Uh, whereas now we're going through a similar phenomenon, uh, but in a purely fiat currency regime. Uh, and so there are a lot of big questions about how they're going to navigate this. Uh, and you know, one of one of my overall views is that basically I, I would position for hyperinflation similar to how I position for inflation anyway. Uh, and so my overall view is basically have hard scarce assets, you know, productive assets or good mon- monetary goods. So some people they prefer gold, some people prefer Bitcoin, some people prefer a mix of both. So those combinations of say commodity producers, hard assets, good real estate, and then good monies is the protection either way against against, you know, a full range of kind of inflationary scenarios. Whereas, you know, if you get into extreme inflation or hyperinflation, then you also have to consider, you know, personal security, uh, kind of kind of prepping type of mindset. Basically have have resources available so that you know, as kind of society goes through very difficult periods, uh, that that you are positioned to you know kind of meet your basic needs for a decent period of time if you have to, if you have a pretty severe breakdown in supply chains uh, and some of these other kind of shortages. So the bondholders and the peasants are going to be paying off the debt for them <laughs> through inflation. Generally, yeah, if people holding bonds or cash historically in this sort of environment are the ones that end up paying a lot of that. Um, and and so it's it's obviously also damaging for people on on fixed incomes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, beneficiaries are generally people that own hard assets, people that have, say, you know, debtors, right? And so, for example, like in, in say, the 70s when you had high inflation, basically anyone who, who held real estate did very well because you had this fixed rate mortgage and you had real estate and the real estate appreciated. Uh, and so there, there's kind of winners and losers, losers across the income spectrum. But the general theme is that cash and bondholders take the, the big hit uh, and debtors uh, and those holding scarce assets generally, generally do pretty well as long as they're debt is not structured so that they are at risk of liquidations because you can have a very volatile event like uh you know there there's i believe it was dan oliver had this chart that that and i i just i heard about it because of luke groman that they they showed gold in the weimar republic the, the price of gold in marks uh and of course it it you know went to like infinity more or less uh because the currency hyperinflated but it wasn't a straight line and so if you had if you had callable debt uh, you know, there were multiple 80% drawdowns uh, in gold during that passage because there are periods of time where, where German officials made it look like they were going to stabilize the currency and they kind of, you know, they kind of reined it in for a little bit of time, but then it broke again. Uh, and so you, gold would have another huge leg up and then it would correct. Uh, and so the key is to have, you know, long denominated debt, uh, you know, like a mortgage or like, say, how Michael Saylor has tried to construct his, his balance sheet uh, rather than that type of like, you know, like uh, the the short term leverage that is callable, um, and and so or or just you know put leverage aside and not use it, but just have kind of those those real assets that whenever the dust settles, and, and people have to kind of reconstruct a new system, that you have things of value uh, that people will want back in in the future. It could be money, could be productive assets, you know, good like hard goods. 